Well, hey, good morning, everyone. So great to see you guys. Let's all stand together as we lift our worship unto God. Let's put our hands together in praise. Come on. church come on hallelujah 
In the presence of my enemies Come on, you sing it out I raise a hallelujah
shout of praise. Amen.
we just thank you for this morning. We thank you that your love is a firm foundation, and I pray that we would have the courage and the tenacity to build our lives upon that, especially in a day of so much shifting sand, so much shifting conviction. Things are so fluid, Lord, but we, we trust you in all things, and we thank you for this time. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning once again, everyone. We're so glad that you're here with us today. Before we continue on our service, why don't you turn to somebody and say good morning. Once again, good morning, Lakeshore. It is great to be spending this morning worshiping with you here today. My name is Dave, and I'm excited to be spending this time with you. If this is your first time here, welcome. We're happy that you're joining us this morning. If you are joining us live online, welcome to you as well. We love spending this time with you. We are so appreciative of this technology that allows us to speak to you. And if you would, let us know where you're watching from. We have moderators there who are chatting alongside with you. You know, here at Lakeshore, we are all about helping people discover and develop a growing relationship with Christ. And that's what we do. That's what our purpose and our mission is. And really how we go about doing that is just establishing a relationship with you. You know, I'm not sure what brings you in through these doors today. I'm not sure what got you to tune in this morning to our service, uh, but we're happy you're here. And we would love to reach out and establish a connection. You know, there are so many different ways to grow here at Lakeshore. I don't know where your spiritual journey is, but wherever it is, we have a space specifically for you. It's called Get Connected. It's just through those double doors. We encourage you to stop by after service. If you hear something today in this message that you're unsure of, maybe you have a question or you're not clear on where your next steps are, we encourage you to stop by Get Connected. Someone will be there willing and able to speak with you and help get you directed on your path. And we have these connect cards. I ask you to pull one out. You can do that right now. These are in the seat back pocket in front of you. Fill out a way that we can get in contact with you. It's not like some creepy stalker thing. We're not going to do anything like that. We just want to say hi this week. And again, uh, also, we have the ability to watch the entire service out in the atrium. So if you have any food or beverages or coffee, we'd ask that you would help us keep the auditorium clean and enjoy that in the atrium. You won't miss a beat. The whole entire service is broadcast live on all the TVs there. So today we are continuing in our brand new series we kicked off last week called Unboxed. And we open it up with developing, uh, I'm sorry, not Unboxed, Unshakable. We open it up with developing unshakable faith. And if you missed that message, I encourage you, check us out on YouTube. You can find that message. You can catch up this week. I was encouraged, and I'm sure that you would be too. My wife and I both left feeling super convicted. You know, in a world with ever-changing, competing worldviews of values and convictions, how do we hold firm in our own convictions that seem to contradict what the world would have us believe? And today, our senior pastor, Pastor Vince DePaulo, is going to join us and help us learn to develop unshakable convictions. Conviction. A held belief or opinion. We all have convictions. Convictions of many things. Morals, politics, spiritual beliefs. But where is the foundation? Where does it begin? But just because you can doesn't mean you should. And when facing times of moral dilemma, our future can change. Our convictions and values can be 
continually redefined, which then can cause us to have no moral value, no solid code to live by. As a result, morals have become fluid. Our convictions have been compromised. When our convictions continually change to fit the situation, there is no solid foundation to stand upon. Everything is fair game. We find ourselves wavering back and forth about what is moral and what isn't. Anyone or anything can come along and completely shake the foundation of what we believe or how we act on a daily basis. But what defines my conviction? What will I allow to shape my conviction? In today's culture, can I find an unshakable conviction? How can I maintain my conditions without changing? Well, good morning, everybody. Hope you're doing well. We began a series last week called Unshakable, and I remember as we were sitting around a, a, a table at a coffee shop thinking through what the series would be about, we decided that we needed to help our people, you guys, all of us, ourselves included, how to stand strong and to live smart, how to make our life a pillar of strength like that light house in a stormy sea, and, and to have lives that, that operate that way. And last week, Pastor Dan Simbel did a fantastic job introducing the series with an appropriate starting point, how to have an unshakable faith, a faith that doesn't move. Today, I want to talk to you about unshakable convictions. So take out your notes and open to Daniel 1. Last week, you had a lot of fun with Pastor Dan Simbel, didn't you? Well, the fun's over today. It's just all over. I just wanted to say that because we have a challenging subject, but I think it's an important one. You know, we live in a day when it's very difficult to have and to hold God-honoring, biblically-driven convictions. I see the compromise of these convictions all the time. Do you? All the time. It comes across when people say things like this. Here are some of the things I hear. I have. Well, I believe, I believe this. But if someone believes that, that's okay. Like, I believe this, but, but, but it's okay if you believe that. On important issues. Or something like this. People say this. You know, you hold your position too strongly. You, you're, you're too certain on that. And because of that, I think you're, and pick your poison, I think you're unloving or rigid or moralistic or legalistic. Or most tragically, I know what God says about that, but, question, does it really matter what you say after but? According to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, convictions means this, a strong persuasion or belief, the state of being convinced. On many things, we should all aim to hold some deep personal convictions that can never be changed. Could you imagine our lives if we didn't operate with convictions? Could you imagine that? If everything was awash with whatever people felt around us? But the truth is, all around us, the world is constantly tempting us to leave our convictions. And it's telling us our convictions aren't a big deal, in fact, really, you'll be happier if you set aside your convictions. Every day there will be times, and there are times, when you and I are tested and faced with the choice rather, whether to do or say or believe the right things. It will happen. It happens every day. And when we do, we're just going to have to make a decision. So I'm just kind of giving you the, the big idea right up front. We have to make a decision. We have to decide if we're going to go with God despite the cost or if we're just going to forsake our convictions, what we know is true, and just go some other way. It's a moral crossroads in effect. But I do know this, and this is important. If you will establish convictions 
that are based on the Bible, the truths of the Bible, convictions that will and have proven to stand the test of time, you may have to pay the price in the short run, but it will spare you from an even bigger price in the long run. Unshakable convictions all hinge on this one question. Whenever you decide, will I honor my convictions or will I go some other way? Here's the question you have to ask yourself, please. Do I wanna pay now or do I wanna pay later? Because you're going to pay some kind of way. It's just now or later. Are you willing to pay a smaller price now by maintaining your convictions to avoid paying a bigger price later for violating them? I've been a part of both options. I've seen both options. I like the pay now option. When I was a kid, I had some weird habits. Now, those of you who know me say, you know, tell me something I didn't know. And one of the weird habits I had as a kid was this. When the TV was on, I would run to the TV to watch the commercials. And then the show would come on, and I'd walk away. So I mean, I know I could sing the Virginia Slims commercial, you come along, way, baby. Remember that? With Terryton, I'd rather fight than switch. This is when cigarettes were on TV. I, I'm really old, I know. Maxwell House, good to the last drop. I think they still even use that. Well, there used to be a commercial for Fram oil filters, which really shows this whole principle in 31 seconds. Watch it. This is a main bearing job, about $200. And this, this is a Fram oil filter, it's about $4. If the guy who owns this car had put four bucks into one of these when he had his oil change, chances are he, he wouldn't be putting 200 bucks into one of these. Well, choice is yours. You can pay me now or pay me later. How many remember that commercial? Not too many old folk in here. All right. What he basically said was, he goes, yeah, I'm just you're repairing this engine because he didn't put in a fram, and you could pay me now or pay me later. Let's apologize for technical difficulties. What convictions do you hold that are being challenged today? What beliefs, what behaviors are you tempted to compromise? Are they in the area, and I'm not picking on anybody, but I'm just going to tell you the truth. Are they in the area of sexuality? Are they in the area of relationships? Are they in the area of honesty, finances, marriage, family? My goal is to help you choose and maintain unshakable convictions. And I realize that this can seem like a heavy message, but I also realize this is one of the most important messages we could ever hear in a nothing's right, nothing's wrong, absolutes always change culture. We need them. So let's talk about maintaining your convictions no matter what. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 1, as I mentioned earlier. A little bit of background's in order. In 612 B.C., the world power was Assyria. Assyria had its headquarters in Nineveh. Think Jonah. Nineveh, headquarters of Assyria. Jonah was around during the Assyrian Empire when it was the world power. In 612, the Babylonians defeated the Assyrians in their capital city, Nineveh, and began to emerge as the world power. And as the Assyrians faded and the Babylonians rose for the next seven years, they asserted their power, and in August 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar became the new king, replacing his father, Nabopolassar, who had just died. A month later, if you're keeping score at home, September 605, Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem, and he began to subjugate the people of the city. He didn't destroy Jerusalem. That wouldn't happen until 19 years later, 586 B.C. And he just subjugated it. Why did God allow Nebuchadnezzar to subjugate his holy city, Jerusalem, for the very thing we're going to talk about today? They violated their convictions. 
So this morning I want to talk about understanding a convictions test and then how to overcome and how to maintain your convictions no matter what. Let's look at the first seven verses. It's going to show us how conviction tests work. Let me just work through it and then give you a couple principles. In the third year, at 605 B.C., of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Notice he didn't destroy it. He besieged the city. Again, Jerusalem wouldn't be destroyed until 19 years later in 586 B.C. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles of the temple of God. So the ten tribes of the north were called Israel, even though all twelve were Israel. They had been wiped out in 722 and 721 by the Assyrians, this previous world empire. This was the beginning of the end for Jerusalem, or Judah, the southern two tribes, and they besieged it. Then it says, these um, articles from the temple of God Nebuchadnezzar carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. And of course, he did this to, to honor his false god. Of course, there are many gods, but one of his false gods, maybe it was the god of war, to honor his false god with the prized possessions of the god, the true god of Israel, and taking them and putting them in the temple of his false god. Now we get to the story. Verse 3. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, the high order people, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. This was standard practice for Nebuchadnezzar, where he would, what he would do is he would go in and he would take the prime people, the royalty, the good-looking ones, the smart ones, he, you know, all the, all the kids that, you know, the most popular kids in, you know, senior year of high school, and he got all those guys. And he did it for one of two reasons, and, and may, or maybe both. The first reason he did it is to potentially hold them as hostages and to send a signal to the rest of the people that you're next if you're caught up. And or secondly to train them so that if he had to subjugate the people of Israel, he would enculturate them, train them in his ways, and they would be further acquainted with how he wanted the rest of the people of Jerusalem to operate by his standards. Whatever it was, it was clearly a power play. Then it says, he was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. His whole goal was simple. He wanted to enculturate them. He wanted them to forsake the culture of the God of Israel and to embrace the culture of the false gods of Babylon. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah. So um, in Daniel, Daniel calls out himself and three other people. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the chief official, gave them new names. To Daniel, he gave the name Belteshazzar. Daniel means God is my judge. Belteshazzar means Bel will protect. Bel was one of their B-E-L, not two L's, just one L. He was one of their many false gods. He gave the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. Hananiah means the Lord is gracious, Shadrach, inspiration of the sun, the sun god. To Mishael, Meshach. Mishael means God is without equal. That's a Jewish Hebrew name. Meshach means belonging to Aku. That's another Akkadian Babylonian god. And then finally, to Azariah, Abednego. Azariah means the Lord is my helper. Abednego means servant of Nego. In other words, they're false gods. By the way, for those of you who are just curious, you notice how Daniel and Mishael end in L? And then Hananiah and Azariah end in A? A, Yah, means Lord. L means God. That's why uh, whenever you see a, a Hebrew name ending in L, it's God. When it, when it ends in Aya or A, -a that, that, that's the Lord. That's a little free lesson for you right there. Just trying. So let me draw out a couple principles from what I just read that will help you. First is this. The biggest test of convictions is, let's stop right there. Don't even give the fill-in. Good. What do you think the biggest test of your convictions is? Think about it. What do you think? What, the biggest test, 
The biggest test of your convictions is convenience. Convenience. It's easier. The number one test of convictions is convenience. Convenience says, if I do that, it'll be harder. If I just give up my convictions, this will be easier. It's easier. It's okay. Just set aside your convictions just, just, just one time. It's okay. Set aside your convictions just on this one issue. You can be right on 90%. Of the, just this is one issue. Be wrong. It's okay. It's okay. Set aside your convictions because it will be less stressful if you do so. See, it's convenient to go along with the world and not God. It is. It's convenient. But convenience will lead to another word, and that's compromise. I hate this word. You know, the Democrats and Republicans are going to compromise. I hate the word compromise. Compromise is like splitting the baby. Nobody wins, right? And you know what? I just think there may be places to compromise in amoral things, things that don't have moral weight. God never compromises morally. I'll tell you a great story. A guy was hunting down a bear. He, he tracks him down. The bear stops. He, he's about 10 yards away from him. He's ready to shoot. The bear starts talking to him. The bear says, uh, hey, 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 before you shoot, can we just talk this out? The guy's like, you can't believe the bear's talking to him. He goes, talk it. He goes, all right, let's talk it out. So the bear says, look, what do you want? And the hunter goes, I want a fur coat made of bear fur. He goes, okay. And then he goes, let me tell you what I want, the bear speaks. He goes, what I want is I want a full stomach. Hunter goes, okay. And so the bear says, well, let's compromise. And the hunter goes, okay, you get what you want, I get what I want. Yeah, absolutely. The bear shook hands with him. 20 seconds later, the bear ate the man, and they both got what they want. <laughs> For some of you, just go out to lunch and somebody will explain exactly what that means. But contrast that to Acts chapter 5, 29, where it says this. Peter and the apostles replied when they were told, stop speaking about Jesus Christ. Would you shut it? Shut it on this subject of Jesus Christ. Look what they said. We must obey God rather than any human authority. What are they saying? We have convictions. We won't choose convenience, and we will not compromise. In the short term, yeah, everything was great. No, short term, verse 40, says they were whipped. In the long term, verse 41, it says the disciples walked away praising God that the Lord, in their minds, the Lord, and in my mind too, the Lord in his goodness allowed them to have the privilege to suffer for his name. And I'm telling you, it's only going to be a little bit here and there, but it's, there's going to come a day and we're going to see who loves Jesus Christ and who loves what he, what, what he gives when it becomes harder and harder to become a Christian in the United States of America. And we'll see who keeps going to the itching ear church that tells you you can have this, you can have that, got to speak it into existence, and who loves Jesus Christ. And we'll see. Biggest test of convictions is convenience. Remember that. Second, Character is seen by what happens in us, not to us. Convictions tests are ultimately about our personal character. What is character? Character is who you are when only God is watching. That's what character is. Character is what happens in us, not what happens to us. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 15, 11. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. He was talking about, oh, the disciples didn't eat the right food. He says that doesn't defile him. What goes into his mouth doesn't. But what comes out of his mouth, that is what defiles them. Why do I say this? Because even though, this is big, even though Nebuchadnezzar assigned these four men 
a new home, a new knowledge, a new culture, a new diet, new names. He could not change their convictions, their character, their values, or their beliefs. It's a powerful example of what we need to know about a conviction test. Here's what I know. The more you know about a test ahead of time, the better chances are you're going to do well on it. So how did Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah respond to these conviction tests the same way we should? So what do you do when your convictions are tested? That's the rest of the passage, and I want to give you three principles from the rest of the passage on how to overcome a conviction test. When your convictions are tested, what do you do? First thing you do involves the principle of dedication. You establish clear convictions up front. Before you face the pressures of the moment, determine your convictions well ahead of time and then be dedicated to them. Know what you believe before you get thrown into the pressure cooker of compromise. Notice verse 8 to 10. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself. Resolved. Another translation says purposed or determined. He was resolved. He had a purpose. He purposed. He determined not to defile himself. Not to defile. Just think of a, a file cabin, right? All your files are in order. Defile means to just like get everything and mess up the files. And it has to do with your moral orderliness. He, he, he refused to change his moral order into some crazy spread. He, he maintained the order of moral integrity that God asked him to. With the royal food and wine. And what was the temptation? Convenience. See what I told you? What was the temp? You, dude, you could eat it up. You could have anything you want. Lifestyles of the rich and famous. Caviar. All that. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now, is there something wrong with eating royal food? No. Is there something wrong with having a little wine? May or may not have been in Jewish tradition, but... I don't think the issue was the food. The issue was the food was sacrificed to the idols of Nebuchadnezzar. And to engage in that food would have been understood by everybody around that you buy into the gods of Nebuchadnezzar. And they said, we can't, we can't even send even a, a potentially mixed signal on this. That's what it was. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. Stop right there. I want you to remember that, because we're going to see later how he literally caused it. God will cause favor on your situation when you put him first. He will give you favor when you have to maintain your convictions. But you have to trust him, but more on that later. But the official told Daniel, even though he had, God had given this man favor for Daniel and his friends, he said this, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. He's torn. He says, you know, I, I like you, Daniel. You're a good guy, and, I, and I, 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 think, I think, you know, the world of you, but I don't want to die. So he's nervous. He's in a tough situation. But here's the point. No matter what, Daniel was not going to violate his God-honoring convictions. And that was because he established his convictions up front, before the conviction test. God does not change. Malachi says, I am the Lord, I do not change. God's views on right and wrong do not change. So if you want to please God and be like God, you will not change your beliefs or convictions, no matter what the world, no matter what the majority of people, no matter what ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, no matter what they say. One text that's been ringing in my head for weeks is this. Roman, in Romans, I think it says, let God be true and every man a liar. In other words, God is the truth. And every other human view that is in contradiction to God is a lie. Bold statement by Paul. 
It starts by saying this, I will only believe this. I will only embrace this. I will only do this. Now let me share why it's so vital to have convictions up front. And here's the principle. The conviction tests you go through, they do not determine your convictions. Tests don't determine convictions, they reveal convictions. Let's say you build a skyscraper, right? Build a skyscraper. You get up to the second floor and you got these steel beams. You get up to the 10th floor and then all of a sudden the weight caves in and the whole building cra crashes because that beam on the second floor gave way. Question, did the building cause the steel beam to fail or did the steel beam cause the building to collapse? Answer is simple. The steel beam caused it. The building weight did not change the steel beam. The building weight revealed that the steel beam was inferior and had a defect. People say, well, you know what, I usually have good convictions, but you know, I just, just this one thing, and it just, the pressure got to me, and I understand that, and I, look, we're all frail, we all have feet of clay, I certainly have feet of clay, I certainly fail all the time, but I'm not making excuses for me either, and that's this. All that tested was revealed that you've got an area to grow in. I think a, a couple years ago I talked about a story where I, I'd done something I rarely did, and we parked one of our cars, our, our Ford Taurus, out in the street. And I think I told you some, some girl had got hammered in her neighborhood, and um, she had to get up real early for work. So she must have pulled a, a late nighter and got maybe a couple hours of sleep. And, She's driving her car, and all of a sudden, our bedroom in our, our previous house was in the front of the house. Bang! You know, 5.30 in the morning, bang! 6 in the morning, something like that. This, and all I heard was, drr, drr, drr. she's trying to start her car, and her car's in my trunk. And uh, she, she, she cracked her head on the windshield. I mean, she literally had a lump on, you know, they're, they don't, like, they're, they're kind of um, shatterproof, so they kind of, they have the... the Spiderwebby cracks in it, but like had a lump, and her head had the same lump in the same shape. So I told the story, and I felt bad, and, and, uh, but I never told the rest of the story. So the rest of the story is this. So this Ford Taurus, we bought this Ford Taurus uh, from my mom's husband, my stepfather's company, Fleet of Cars, which meant it was a sales car, tons of miles for a relatively newer car. Now again, this car, it did not have the leading one in front. So in other words, it had five places in the tents. It didn't have six. So the odometer said 57,000 miles. But because it was so new, Progressive gave me a check for 57,000, but the car really had 157,000 miles on it. And I got a check, I go, great, this is a little more than I thought. Then I read the letter. Here's the check for your car with 57,000 miles on it. I had a decision to make. Now I'd love to tell you, I'm going immediately to Progressive. <laughs> Took me three hours. I'm telling you, I just went. I started to look up scripture. I couldn't find a verse for it. Oh. I'll never forget, I went down to Henrietta to Progressive office. And I said, I'm here to give you this check back. Why? You gave me too much. The lady looked at me and she goes, okay. <laughs> and she, she looked at me like I was from another world. That was my goal. For those of you who are interested, I was Italian. I pulled out my Dago Italian negotiating power and I did get it kind of halfway in between the 57 and the 157, so I did. All right, anyway, probably didn't need to know that. But here's the point. That stuff, only, you guys aren't laughing. I hope the leaven is better than you. The, that only happens when you establish clear convictions up front and stay dedicated to them. So here's my question for you. Do you know what you will always do? Do you know what you'll always believe? Right now. Do you know what you will never do? Do you know what you will never believe? right now. This 
is why we believe the Bible. The Bible is always true. I don't know if you believe that. If you don't, I hope you will. You just need to know we believe that. Every word of the Bible is true. It doesn't fail people. It's never failed me. Many of you would say, it's never failed me either. And your convictions must be based on the Bible. I think of Jesus' words in Matthew 7. If your convictions are based on the Bible, it's like building your house on a rock. And if your convictions are based somewhere else, it's like building your house on quicksand. The more you read it, the more you become like it. I think Chuck Swindoll said, you read the Bible so you, so you, you become biblene. Biblene. Dedication. Establish all your convictions clearly up front. Second thing, when you face a convictions test, and the second principle is the principle of demonstration, and that's this. Turn your conviction into actions. It's not enough to say, this is what I believe. What are you going to do? Are you going to do what you believe? That's important. It's where the rubber meets the road. You have to find the right way to turn your deep convictions into right moral actions. Notice how Daniel does it. He's very smart about it. He realizes the pressure he's in. I'm not compromising. This man feels like he's going to be doomed if the right thing isn't done. So watch this. It's brilliant. Daniel then, in verse 11, said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. He didn't say, let us do this for five years and let's see what happens. You know, very reasonable. He says, let's do a 10-day, this is a short test. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat, not that pagan sacrificed food, and water to drink, not that pagan sacrificed wine. He didn't say, dude, look, I ain't changing, pal. You go tell Nebi, I ain't doing it. He, did, he didn't ask, you know, there's a lot of Christians that do that, you know. Oh, this is the truth. This is the truth. And I, I just want to go, brother, brother, thank you for telling people the truth. But dude, you are as rough as sandpaper. One time I was at a jazz fest and I go, not, not a jazz fest, the Rochester Jazz Fest. I like jazz music. My wife and I go all the time. So well-intended Christians were there. Okay, so they are taking some abuse, like some really bad abuse. And one guy walked by and looked at him. He goes, you are so full of, you can imagine, Another lady walked by and blah, 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 and these guys lost it. And they go, look at you with your short hair. And they started laying into her. And uh, it was tough. So I'm going to get my Louisiana food. That's, they have a little Louisiana little thing on that street. I don't, know what, I don't know the city. I just know the street. I know how to get there. But thank God I had sunglasses on because underneath I was just crying. Because I know these guys meant well. Man, I wanted to go up with them. And you know what? The Bible says, you know how you overcome evil, brother? With good. And a lot of times we have the right belief, but we have the terrible, the worst way of communicating it. God cares just as much about what you believe as he does how you Share it. Speak the truth in love. And that's what I love about Daniel. He didn't put the guy in a tough position. He just said this. Then compare our appearance with what the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. Daniel had a wise plan to maintain his unshakable convictions. Do you? You need to have a plan you need to have stock phrases that when you're caught in a convictions test, you need to have the right words and the right actions. And you need to be firm, but gracious, strong, but polite. No, I won't do that. 
If you want to stay my friend, you won't ask me to do that again in the future. I believe this is what the Bible teaches. And if you want, I can help you because I don't think you believe the right thing about what the Bible teaches. And maybe no one's ever told you. Maybe you never understand. Instead of saying, what? You believe that? You are wrong. It's like, dude, you're mean. And then sometimes you go, and you got bad breath. Phew, oh, man. Here's another one. Hey, when you say that, do you realize that that's not good? Sometimes you don't. I remember one time I was at Dallas Seminary, and we were living on a lower amount of money, and so they would have a, a, a bakery that would donate food. And um, so we'd grab a couple loaves of bread, and then they had these donuts. And I saw this donut. I looked at it. I said, oh, my G-O-D. I didn't realize that was taking the Lord's name in vain. I'm Italian, so they say that every five minutes in my house. And um, this guy said, I can't believe you said that. And I go, said what? And he, and he just meanly just ripped into me. And I didn't mean it. I now realize it's, it's not, you don't, you don't want to say that. But he just was mean. And I play, guys with, I play golf with some guys, and sometimes some, I play with some of your friends who say this. Like, they'll hit a bad shot. You know, you ever see some, they hit a bad shot, they never go, what the Muhammad? <laughs> they, they never blame Muhammad. So here's an example of how you handle it right. Jesus! And you go, loves you. <laughs> and you make your point with honey better than vinegar. Do you know how to act in ways that help you maintain your convictions? Do you have clear lines that you will not cross? And I'll give you a warning. Compromise usually starts really, really small and then it gets big. People who commit adultery don't go, you know, I have a great marriage, wake up, ah, oh, what a great day for adultery. Mm -mm. No, no. Look a little too long at that, look a little porn, look a little this, look a little that, get in an argument with the wife, go at work, she treats me so nice. I don't know what happened, I just ended up in bed with her. I know exactly what happened. Frog in a kettle. One person said, show me a person who has fallen away from the Lord, and I'll show you a person who has started making small compromises in their actions a long time ago. One more. You still love me? Okay. Like me a lot, at least. Okay. Okay. One more. And that's the principle of destiny. Trust your conviction to God's provision. Holding unshakable convictions takes faith. Pastor Dan talked about this masterfully last week. We have to believe that God is true and that he'll make a way to prevail for us. He always will. Notice what he did for Daniel and his three friends. So they're under this test, verse 15 to 16. At the end of the 10 days where they ate the vegetables and the water, they didn't look as good. Look at what it says. They looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. And that's how it always is with God. After the test is over, you're in better shape than the people who compromised. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. God had provided, so they held their convictions without further problems. God was faithful, and on top of that, God honored them in return for honoring him. Look at the last part of the chapter, verse 18 to 20. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into a service, what was that? Remember that earlier on? It was what? Three years. The chief official presented them Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In other words, this three-year test was to see they qualified to be in the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. That's what happens when you trust godly convictions to God's provision. He's faithful. And it wasn't just a one-time thing. If you read the rest of the book of Daniel, 12 chapters long, in chapter 3, Daniel's three friends were, were willing to die in the fiery furnace instead of falling down and worshiping a gold image dedicated to Nebuchadnezzar, or maybe it was of Nebuchadnezzar. We don't know for sure. And then it says they went into a fiery furnace which was jacked up with extra heat, and the guys who threw them in died. It was so hot. And they look and they say, 
I see the three friends of Daniel. And there's a fourth person. It looks like the Son of God. And it may have been a pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 6, Daniel, who's 80 plus years old, his enemies made a law to try to bait and switch him. And they said this, for 30 days you can't pray to anybody but Darius the Mede, Darius the Mede, also known as Cyrus. And Daniel says, not only will I pray, I'm going to pray like I normally do, toward Jerusalem with the windows open, everybody can see me. Thrown in the lion's den. And what does God do? He puts the lion on a vegan diet. Right? Then he gets out. The king finds out the plan. He throws the other guys in there, and all of a sudden he's really flesh hungry. He mauls them. Do you know that Daniel is one of the very, very few people in the Bible who's given extended treatment, and there's not one fly ever presented in his ointment? It's amazing. So let me end with this last thought. Convictions always determine destiny. Convictions always determine destiny. Right now, your destiny is being determined by your convictions or your lack thereof. Convictions set the course for the rest of your life. Are you clear in your convictions? If not, get into a small group. Come to church regularly. Here's another conviction. Oh, you don't have to go to church every week. Okay, believe that if you want. Silly. Come to church every week. Get around people that think the way you do. Read the Bible. Get in a small group. We have so much to offer. Honestly, sometimes I wonder if we have too much. Are you strong in your convictions? If not, ask God. Say, God, give me a resolve. Pray it. Give me a resolve, Lord God, to think the way you do. Remember, when you compromise convictions, it's easier in the immediate, but it's a lot harder in the long run. But when you have unshakable convictions, it's harder in the immediate. That's so much easier in the long run. You could pay me now, or you can pay me later. Let's all bow our heads. Sometimes we have to have a more challenging side to our messages, and this happens to be one of those days. And to me, this is not between me and you. To me, this is all about between you and God. That's all. So I just ask you to do a little business with God. Where are your convictions today? Is there a line you will not cross? What areas of your life kept popping in your mind and you go, ooh, ooh, not good, not good? We all have them. You have been listening to a man who also has them. I'm a mess. You're a mess. Jesus Christ can help. Jesus Christ was perfect. He was tempted in every way, Scripture says. Tempted every single way. Yet he never sinned because he had convictions. And the place to develop strong convictions is to start a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And you do that by saying, Jesus Christ, you are holy, I'm sinful, I believe you died on the cross for me, took my place, I put my exclusive faith in you. I trust you to forgive me, and I ask you to come in my life and be the director or Lord of my life. And if you say that through faith alone in him alone, you have eternal life. And you've begun not only a great journey of convictions, a great journey of meaning and purpose in life. And then when you die, you'll stand before God and Jesus will say, welcome into heaven. You'll spend eternity there. So say that prayer, mean that prayer. Let us know about it. Father, help us all pass the convictions test with unshakable convictions in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for that, Pastor Vince. A challenging message. If you were just someone who prayed with Pastor Vince, if you just made that intentional decision to accept Jesus as your Savior, we want to let you know how excited we are for that decision. And we want to come alongside you. And just like Pastor Vince mentioned a moment ago, we want to know about it so that we can come alongside you, so we can help you get some resources into your hands and help you in this new walk, in this new journey, in this new relationship. So that Connect card that I talked about earlier in the service, if you flip that over on the back side, there's a checkbox that says, I'm making a first-time faith commitment. 
You could check that box and drop that in the offering bucket as it passes you by. And if you're joining us online live as well, you can check that box as well. You can fill out that Connect card and submit it, and we'd love to reach out and connect with you and get some resources into your hands. And I love what Pastor Vince said earlier in the message about turning your convictions into action. And maybe today you have a new conviction. And whether you're a brand new Christian from this moment forward, or you've been a Christian for a long time, and if you haven't been baptized, that could be your next actionable step to place your convictions into action and so that we could celebrate with you your relationship with Christ, you being a Christian. And so we have a, a baptism orientation coming up on uh, March 24th, and we have these baptism cards here as well. You can find those in the seat back pocket in front of you. I want to encourage you right now to take that out or just take it home with you and consider it. Fill it out, and you can drop that in the offering bucket as it passes you by. So at this time, I'd like to call our greeters forward as we receive the offering. And while that's going around, we want to extend our gratitude, our deepest thanks to you for being obedient to God and for supporting this ministry. Like I said earlier, you're helping this church uh, help people discover and develop a growing relationship with Christ. It allows us to do what we do here, to be connected to you online, all these things. So we thank you for that. And if you guys have prayer, if you want to pray with someone immediately right now after service, we're going to have members of our prayer team. They're going to be right down here at the bottom of the stage willing and ready to pray directly with you and for you. So we encourage you to take advantage of that. If there's anything that you heard in today's message, in today's service, anything at all, we want to have a conversation with you. So we always have that Get Connected space where you can find somebody with a lanyard on and we'd be happy to conversate with you. So at this time, I'd like to ask you guys to stand and we'll pray and we'll dismiss. Lord God, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for this convicting message. God, help everyone in attendance here and everyone listening online, live and in future recordings. Lord, we just thank you. Help us to grow into this conviction, into this, this practice of acting in our convictions. Lord, I lift everyone up here to you. Be with us as we walk. Be with us this week. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. We love you. Have an awesome week. We'll see you next week. Thanks for being part of Lakeshore Church Online. We really hope that you enjoyed this experience and that you found encouragement in the message. If you have questions about Lakeshore, who we are, what we have going on here, stop on to lakeshorechurch.org. And again, if you're local, we would love to meet you here at Lakeshore. We have services every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. We hope you have a great week.